Amen. Please be seated. As you're sitting down, please open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. As we continue in that small break out of 1 Corinthians, and today, again, we're going to talk about Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So the day that we celebrate Palm Sunday was also known as Preparation Day for Passover week for the Jewish people. But it's also known as something else. It's known as Lamb Selection Day. Lamb Selection Day. Passover, you may remember, is when Moses went to Pharaoh and asked Pharaoh, let the Hebrew children go free. He refused, so God sent the plagues onto Egypt. After several plagues, Pharaoh continued to harden his heart against God. And so as he's hardening his heart, God said there's going to be one more plague. The Israelites were to go, slaughter a lamb, and take some of its blood and put it on the doorpost of their house. And if they did that, that night the angel of death would go by, and anyone's house who had the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, the angel of death would pass over. If there was no blood on the doorpost, the angel of death would then kill the firstborn. Those who believed the Lord, the angel passed over, spared their firstborn, and now here we are in our text today, 1,500 years later, 2 to 3 million people have been visiting Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day, the beginning of his Passion Week, preparing for his death and resurrection. And so you might ask, what is Lamb Selection Day? I'm so glad you asked. According to Exodus chapter 12, on the 10th day of the first month known as Nisan, every man was to select a lamb for his family, for his household to eat, slaughter, of course, and celebrate Passover. The lamb was to be a one-year-old male without blemish or defect, and the family, catch this, was to take that lamb into their own house and spend four days with this lamb, getting attached to it before then slaughtering it and eating it. Arriving on Lamb Selection Day, this is basically what Jesus Christ is shouting to the people. I am the Passover lamb who came to sacrifice myself for the world's sin. So Jesus rides in 1,500 years after the first Passover on Lamb Selection Day, to be scrutinized for four days by the people. Four days examine the lamb to see if he is who he said he was. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, the Lord has need of them. The Lord has need of them. If your Bibles are open, Matthew chapter 21, begin with verse one. It says, now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. So here's Jesus, and he's approaching Mount Olivet, and he tells his two disciples, hey, go get these two donkeys, right? And, and we have no idea, was this prearranged? I mean, if some guy shows up at your house and says, hey, I have need of those two mopeds in your backyard, would you just, oh, well, go ahead, take them. We have no idea if this is prearranged. We don't even know if this guy knew the Lord at all. Mark 11, 5 says, but some of those who stood there said to them, that is the disciples, what are you doing loosening the colt? The Lord has need of them. Jesus uses the word curios for Lord here. Curios. And, and that's curious that he uses the word curios. <laughs> the Lord, curios. It means boss, master, owner, possessor, controller of something. So notice what Jesus is saying. The owner of those donkeys has need of them. The controller of nature has need of them. The one who possesses all things and to whom all things belong has need of those two donkeys. Listen to what Barry Rayburn said about this. 
When they came to untie the colt, the owner said, why are you untying it? This was an issue of ownership. It was an issue of lordship. When he heard the words, the Lord, or the owner, master, has need of it, all we know is that in that very moment, there in your notes, the owner relinquished his rights and ownership of the colt and recognized something or someone more powerful than him was exercising their rights to the use of the animal. Think about this. The Lord, the owner, the controller, has need. The owner of these, these two donkeys says, take them. No problem. When we inspect Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, we are sort of having a lamb inspection day of our own, are we not? Inspect his claims. Lamb selection day. But John 15, 16 says this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit. You see, when we respond to the gospel message and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're actually following his will for our lives as well. Did he choose me or did I choose him? Yes, absolutely. And, and like the owner of that donkey, at the moment of salvation, catch this, it's so important, Christian, hear this. If you hear nothing else, hear this. The moment of salvation, all prior ownership of your life by the world, by the devil, by sin, by the flesh, all prior ownership is gone. They no longer have a right to your life. You have to let them now. Do you understand that? Just like the donkeys. The owner said, the Lord has need of them, take them. When we give our heart to Jesus Christ, the Lord has need of you. Take it, Lord. The flesh, the world, Satan, no longer has a right to your life. It's all done. It's all over. Today, I want to encourage you. The Lord has need of you. And not in the way that I have need. Okay, don't, don't hear me say that God needs us for anything. He does not. Not in the sense that he can't do something without you. But in the sense that he wants to use you to further his kingdom. What a blessing it is that the God who created out of nothingness, he can create anything. He calls dead things as if they're alive. He can do anything. He says, you know, I have need of you. I want to use you for something in my kingdom. And again, God can do anything. When we first come to Christ, remember when you first became a Christian? I remember it like it was yesterday. How excited I was. I was so foolish. I believed God could do anything. I was so foolish. I believed God could, could anything, move mountains. God can do it all. But I'm much more mature than that now, right? But I was struck with this incredible truth that God actually can do anything, but he wants to use me. And that's so crazy. But there in your notes, as we grow in our Christian walk with the Lord, we begin to realize the Lord has a plan and a purpose for us in his kingdom. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. Workmanship, that's poema, his masterpiece, his Mona Lisa, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Before time began, he looked forward through time and said, that one, she's mine, and she's going to do this. I'm preparing her for that. What an honor and a privilege to know that the creator God of the universe had you on his mind before he created the earth to do something, part of his ministry. Psalms 34, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. So here it is. Taste and see. Inspect the lamb. Is he who he said he was? Can he do what he said he could do? Inspect. Taste and see. God doesn't say, hey, blind faith. No, taste and see. Come inspect the lamb. Come inspect. All right, so number two, and here is every atheist nightmare. Prophecy fulfilled. This is the one they can't deny. Prophecy fulfilled. 
Look at verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Unlike any earthly king, here comes Jesus in humility, total humility, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. Imagine this. The promised Messiah should be coming in on this white stallion, commanding worship, but instead, he comes as this humble servant, willing to lay down his life, because he had to, or we're doomed forever. But this whole narrative is a fulfillment of many prophecies. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. There are 305 specific prophecies of Jesus Christ throughout the Old Testament. Happened thousands of years before Jesus walked the face of the planet. And the number is just so big you can't even imagine for him just to fulfill eight of those. And here it is, hundreds of years before he walked the earth. Zechariah said in Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. But the disciples, they don't get it. They still don't get it. We're a week away from the cross. Still don't get it. And you think, how could they not get it? But how many things do we not get? <laughs> when God speaks to us and we go, I just don't get it. And someone else is saying, how could you not get it? It's so plain. But there's another prophecy I want to tell you about, and this one is just wild. Just a wild prophecy. And again, there's over 305 in the Old Testament specifically about Messiah. And this one's one of the clearest prophecies that there was only one man in all history, out of all the billions of people who have ever lived, who could have fulfilled this. And it comes out of the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. Verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. I've shared this before, but Sir Robert Anderson was the chief inspector of Scotland Yard, and he wrote the book, The Coming Prince, back in the 1800s, 1894. And, and Sir Robert found out that this edict that Daniel was talking about is the edict for Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem. And it came from King Artaxerxes, catch this, in 445 B.C. Those of you who are mathematicians, keep this in mind. 445 B.C. is when the edict was given. From the time of the edict to Nehemiah, Daniel says there's going to be 69 seven-week periods until Messiah the Prince comes. Based on the Babylonian calendar of 365 days per year, write this all down because there's a test on it, it adds up to exactly 173,880 days. And you go, great, Rich, you can add. That's fantastic. Chuck Missler said, between March 14th, 445 B.C., and April 6, 32 A.D., is exactly 173,880 days exactly to the very day. April 6, 32 A.D. was the Sunday before Passover, which we know as the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Let me ask you a stupid question. How many other men rode into Jerusalem that day on the colt of a donkey? 173,880 days exactly. You know, it'd be pretty cool if Jesus was within, you know, 100 years when he predicted this, right? It'd be pretty cool if he got within 1,000 years. But to the day, who could prophesy that? It's almost like God can tell the future before it happens. And so here's, again, the disciples, and they're thinking, Jesus, you're our king, man. We got this white stallion for you to ride in on, and you're so awesome. Let's go. Remember from last week we were talking about James and John's mom, the sons of Zebedee? 
Their mom came to Jesus in Matthew 20, and he, she comes to Jesus and says, what do you wish? And she said, grant to me that one of my sons would sit on your left and one of your, my sons would sit on your right when you come into your kingdom. They've got this idea that Jesus is going to defeat Rome, going to ruin the Roman rule over Jerusalem, and that he's going to set up his kingdom, and he's coming in right now, and the people are on the line in the streets, and there's, here's our king, and they're like, we can't wait. There in your notes, the disciples didn't understand Jesus was not coming as their physical king to fight Rome, but instead as the king of peace. Carson said Jesus was not only proclaiming his messiahship and the fulfillment of scripture, but he was showing the kind of peace-loving approach he was making to the city. There in your notes, for three years, Jesus has been urging those he healed not to tell other people who he was. But now the time has come for the first public proclamation. Israel's Messiah is here. You no longer have to be quiet about who I am. No longer avoid calling me king. No longer avoid calling me Messiah. Here I am. The lamb is presenting himself for inspection. Here I am. And again, just imagine... Those people back in Exodus chapter 12, bring this lamb into your house, pet it, hug it, love it, kill it. Wow. Wow. The lamb was to live with the family for four days, become part of the family so they'd get attached to it. You see, here's the thing. The Lord wanted the sacrifice to be something precious. Wanted it to be precious. There in your notes... Jesus is about to present himself to all of Israel to be inspected by them as the Lamb of God one week prior to Passover. Remember when John the Baptist saw him in John chapter 1? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was like three years too early, right? And, and so the Lamb that was to be offered, and this is cool too, was to be without spot or without blemish. Without spot or without blemish. The perfect lamb. 1 Peter 1.18 Knowing that you were not re redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your father, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So here it is. The lamb of God. No blemish, no spot. And by the way, children of the Most High God, if you will receive the Lord Jesus Christ and have his blood wash over you, you are now without blemish or without spot. That's good news. We are spotless and redeemed because the Lamb of God. All right, Roman numeral three, save now. Save now. Look at verse seven. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed, crying, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Now the law tells us that the use of palm branches was to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. There in your notes. Leviticus 23, 40. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day of the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. As the years went by, the Jewish people started using palm branches to celebrate all the different feasts. And here, by the people setting their clothes on the donkey and putting their clothes out, was actually proclaiming him as king. That's what they're doing with their clothes. This is king. A king can't sit on that donkey without some clothes to sit on. We would never have our king do that. And so they put their clothes down. And the crowd hears this. And all they're thinking is, we have been subjects of Rome for all these years, here comes our conquering king, 
Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Here's our king. You see, these people grew up learning these prophecies from birth. The moment they could understand words, they were taught these prophecies. They knew when Messiah was going to come. They knew how he would come. They knew all of these things. And all of a sudden they're saying, it's got to be Messiah. This is him. Oh man, get ready. And this is another messianic prophecy, by the way, out of Psalms 118. 118, 26 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Now you understand why the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him, right? Here's the Jewish leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, and they're watching this whole thing go down. And here are these people proclaiming Jesus is Messiah, Jesus is God, here he is, get ready. And these religious leaders are like, we're going to kill him and them, right? Every good Jew knew these prophecies. There's no doubt about it. And the word Hosanna comes from the Hebrew language, which means save now, Savior, rescue. Save now, the one true Messiah. Save me, rescue me. So when we sing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, what we're saying is, God, save me. Who here wants to be saved? <laughs> so the next time we sing Hosanna, I better hear those voices. Hosanna, there in your notes. The crowd is basically shouting, save us, Messiah. Save us. You see, just as the Jews were saved from the angel of death back there in Egypt, so now anyone who trusts in the shed blood of Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will save you the moment, the moment you place your faith in him. But the people miss the whole point. They, they're just not getting it. Again, they want this conquering king, and they think, you know, he's just going to come in and start an insurrection. He's going to take over Rome. Here we go. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. First, I've got to eradicate man's sin problem. You understand there's a problem here, folks. The penalty for sin is death. And everyone, every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I've got to eradicate man's sin problem before I can give you a physical kingdom. And they're just not getting it. But you're God. You can do anything. Hebrews 9.22. According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And catch this. This is part of the law. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no remission. Someone's got to bleed and die. And by the way, the person that bleeds and dies has got to be perfect, without spot, without blemish. And there's only one. There in your notes. Just as any blood would, not just any blood would provide forgiveness of sins, it had to come from a perfect spotless sacrifice. And again, everyone's born in natural sin. We can't get away from it. We are children of Adam for sure. And, and so there's got to be redemption. There's got to be payment. And the people didn't realize Messiah first was coming to die for the sins of the world. Then he's going to rule and reign. You can be sure that during the millennial kingdom, when Jesus comes back and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and the other one in the sea, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and he will rule and reign over a perfect kingdom. But first, the cross. But first, penalty for sin. First, the cross. And, and the crowd, and not even his disciples understood it until much later. John 12, 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Not until he's glorified do they finally have a V8 moment. Oh, that's what it was. So back there on the road, People are rejoicing. They've put clothes on these donkeys. They're hail with the palm trees and hail the king of the Jews. Here comes Jesus. And what happens? 
The cities moved. Roman numeral four, the cities moved. Look at verse 10. And when he'd come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Catch this. Jesus rides in on this unbroken foal of a donkey, and the religious leaders buck at his leadership. But the unbroken donkey knows who this king of glory is, and that donkey doesn't buck at the king riding him. The donkey had more sense than the rulers that day. <laughs> Remember way back when Jesus calmed the sea for the disciples. Remember the disciples got all worked up. Oh, we're going to die. And Jesus is kind of sleeping and all that's going on. And they're under, not understanding what's going on. And this is what Luke 8, 25 says. And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. And they obey him. So the cities moved, and they're saying, who is this? Who is this that shakes up this major city? Who can this be now? I think someone made a song like that. <laughs> Bear in your notes. The word moved in Matthew 21.10 is the Greek word sio. It means to shake, agitate or to cause to tremble. We know we get the English word seismic, right? And that measures earthquakes. I'm from San Francisco, so I know exactly what it means. But here's the thing. Jesus always shakes things up. Jesus is never coming into your life and leaving you where you are. Forewarning. Maybe I shouldn't tell you that if you've never accepted Jesus. I want to stay right where I am, but I want all state fire insurance. Sorry, it's not happening. Jesus is going to come into your life. He's going to shake things up. Serving the Lord is life's greatest adventure. Let me tell you, it's not always been easy, but it's always been exciting. Jesus shakes things up when he comes into your life. There in your notes, when Jesus enters a person, nothing will ever be the same. Jesus didn't come to die to leave your life in status quo. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. So when he makes you alive together with Christ, he's shaking things up. And, and after this event, just days before his crucifixion, the people in Jerusalem are left without excuse. The city's shaking. Nature's proclaiming. There's no excuses. It's happening. There in your notes, Jesus was hoping that the city would recognize and receive the free gift of salvation. And they're saying, who is this Jesus? I've heard the rumors about this guy. The rumors are just incredible. All these miracles surrounding his birth. And, and, and he confounded the leaders there in the temple when he was only 12 years old. They couldn't even figure out. They couldn't outsmart a 12-year-old. He gathered around him these few disciples and what a motley crew they were. Who would do this? Then he went and healed all these people. He did all these things. Who is this guy? And knowing the opposition ahead, he enters in from the Mount of Olivet in, into Jerusalem. He knows what's coming. The city is shaking. It's in an uproar. And here's the problem. The problem with that is the Romans can hear all this commotion going on. And they're asking, what are those Jews up to now? And they're in danger because if the Roman garrison hears of this and they send in the soldiers, they're going to wipe them out. And they're going to take away any little power they still have. You see, the Antonio Fortress was right next to where all this is happening. This Roman garrison, and they hear all this going on. And the religious leaders are thinking, shut him up now. If they come in, they're going to wipe us out and take away our little bit of power. Luke 19.39 says this, And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples there in your notes but he answered and said to them i tell you the truth that these keep silent the stones would immediately cry out i love that song ain't no rock ain't no rock gonna cry out my part you see jesus is the creator god and even nature can't deny it 
His disciples may be slow to learn. The people there in Jerusalem may be slow to learn. The religious leaders of the day may not understand. But like he said, if they keep silent, the rocks are, are going to cry out. The rocks are. You know, you have all this going on, and Jesus knows who he is, and he knows who they are too. And you would say, why is Jesus so upset with them? Because he knows they're ruining themselves with sin. And his heart is broken for his creation. Here he is a week before the cross. And he's like, if you only knew, Jerusalem, if you only knew who it was that stood before you. And he starts to weep. He knows they're destroying himself and he's broken hearted over it. There in your notes. We should have the same heart as Jesus. Recognizing people who are destroying themselves with their sin and being heartbroken over it. You know, just before this, Jesus healed two blind men. And now he weeps over Jerusalem because they're so spiritually blind, they can't recognize who's standing in front of them. And the religious leaders refuse to have Jesus as their king. Jesus told a parable in Luke 19 where he said, the religious leader said this, we will not have that man rule over us. You see, the crowds want a physical king. The crowds want a physical kingdom. But the religious leaders are like, we won't have that man rule over us. But here's the problem. To have true peace, there has to be a remedy for sin. There has to be. The prophet Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah 59 too, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We will not have this man rule over us at any cost. How about damnation? We will not have this man rule over us. But what if he is who he said he was? You've had all this time to inspect him. We will not have this man rule over us. So let's get practical this morning. Less than a week after this event, they're going to crucify the king of glory. And as Jesus rode in, again, the town is all shooken up. And I would tell you this morning, if your life is shaken up this morning and you don't have peace, you need Jesus. You'll get that perfect peace if you'll take Jesus at his word. You see, this morning, every one of us has a choice. And you would say, I'm not going to make a choice. Well, not to make a choice is to make a choice against Jesus. Every one of us here this morning have a choice to say, Hosanna, Lord, save me now. Or we can be like the religious leaders of that day and say, I will not have this man rule over me. I can take care of myself. I don't need Jesus. I've had family members for years tell me Jesus is a crutch, and I say, okay, so what's yours? I need Jesus as my crutch. Will you have this man rule over you this morning? Because, see, the answer to that question has eternal consequences. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. So will you accept this man to rule over you? When Abraham went up to sacrifice his son, we're told in Genesis 22.8, God will provide himself a lamb. God's going to provide himself as the lamb. Revelation 5.12 Jesus said to John, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Jesus is our Passover lamb. God the Father sent his son Jesus to become a man, grow up, and that day he rode into Jerusalem, and it's lamb inspection day. This is the day. Discover who he is. This is the day. See if he is who he said he was. And if he is who he said he was, you have a decision to make. This is Lamb Selection Day. And and just think about what a God of detail we have. A God of detail, he says, all the way back in Daniel, 173,880 days exactly, Messiah's going to ride in on a donkey that day. And by the way, it's Lamb Inspection Day. Everything was planned to the last detail. Everything was. And the crowds are hoping for this physical king, yet Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost, so I've got to die. First the cross. Even his own disciples, don't take the cross, Jesus. What's wrong with you? No. 
There in your notes, today we're given a chance to inspect the lamb and receive salvation. What I have found out is that most non-believers haven't taken the time to really study for themselves to discover who Jesus was. They would refute his claims, they would say they have, but if they ever took the time to see the historical evidence, the prophecies and everything else, there's no denying who Jesus was. There's no denying that a physical Jesus came to earth. There's no denying that he was who he said he was. And if indeed he was God the Son, who came down from heaven, grow up and take the cross at Calvary, we have a decision to make. Jesus said very clearly, I am the only way to the Father. He left very little wiggle room at all. We have all the proof we've ever needed. We don't need like two more days to decide on it. We don't need anything else. We have all we could ever imagine. There's never been a time in history that more knowledge about Jesus has been available than there is today. And the best thing we have is that he demonstrated his own love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us on that cross. And since you have the proof, since you have the evidence, the only question is, what will you do with this information? God loves you. You know, I, I've heard about these religions that teach that, you know, if you do this and you do this, you could lose this, you could do that, you could do that, if you don't get it just right. And I think, do we really serve a God who's looking for a technicality to send us to hell? Because God had me. He had me dead to rights in my sins and trespasses, and yet he chose to die for me because he loves me. And so here's the, here's the question. Number one, will you have this man rule over you? And then number two, will you go out and tell other people who are dead in their sins and trespasses that there's somebody who came to seek and save them? The whole mission statement, I came to seek and save that which was lost. Man, that's such a simple mission statement, but that's the truth. So we need to spread this love of Christ after we've accepted it. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. The cry for the one true Messiah. Rescue me. You came to my rescue. Rescue me. Save me. Will you remain as the people who wanted their own version of a king? That's the only question. You see, you're going to have a king. Who's it going to be? Or will you worship him in spirit and truth and accept the true Messiah and have him forgive your sin? And again, eternal consequences. And I would say, Lord, I want to offer you my whole heart. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I know that I know that I know 173,880 days after the edict from King Artaxerxes, Jesus rode in to Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey to show me it's Lamb Inspection Day. See if I am who I said I am. And if I am, you've got a decision to make. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. And every week we have some folks in the back who'd like to pray for you. And I'd, I'd ask you this morning, if today you don't know my Jesus... If today you're not living that peace-filled life, even in the midst of storms, then I'd love to tell you about him. Because the same God who said the rocks would cry out if my people don't worship is the same God who could save you even today, all these years later, because he loves you. And if you, again, you think he's trying to get you on a technicality, he had you. He had you. He came to seek and save that which is lost. Will you pray with me? Gracious Father, we love you so much. And Lord, what a God of detail. First, you tell us that you created us and, and, and gave us good works to do before the foundation of the world. And then you determined the exact day that Jesus would ride in and Lamb Inspection Day, the Passover Lamb who would take away the sin of the world. God, I pray that you would put that truth so deep ingrained in our heart that, Lord, we would see your face there on the cross as you cried out, it is finished, and you took the penalty for our sin, that we would accept that. And, Lord God, that we would celebrate by yelling out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, because you have saved us to the uttermost. 
Father, help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Help us to know that you love us and help us, Lord God, to have this man rule over us in all that we say and do. We thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for loving a wretch like me. And we praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you are blessed. If you'd like to find out more info about our church or any other resources like sermon notes or things like that, you can check out our website at livingfaithklamath.com. Make sure, if you haven't already, to subscribe or like us on whatever your favorite podcast app is. You'll find us at Living Faith Fellowship Klamath Falls. Again, be blessed. Be blessed.